um, indent a little bit, then we get the previous value of a. And this, of course, is also the same if you say, okay, I take a list. Here, let a be an empty list. And then um, a is one cons with a. Okay. Um, by the way, uh, this in um, parentheses, this is um, the a sharp notation for unit. Unit is similar to the void data type in C. It means nothing. And um, so if you have a function which does not take an argument and doesn't have a result, then it's unit to unit. A projection from unit to unit. And uh, why I'm using this here? A let binding always consists of let of what you want to bind, the equal sign, and what shall be bound to the part on the left, and then the let body, where, um, where this bound variables actually are used. And usually you do not need to write in something in F-sharp. That's completely optional. But this do here, through that um, outdenting of the printfn, this let block would um, close. But if there is absolutely no expression within the let body, then it would be an incomplete um, statement, an, in an incomplete expression, I mean. And incomplete expressions are compiled, uh, compiled from error, of course. So this is why I say, okay, I say in because I want to start the body at the same uh, line. And then say unit, and this body then just returns type unit, nothing. Okay, so, uh, so we have bind let a to 3, let a be 3, do let a be 2 in this expression which only returns unit. And then on the outside we still have 3. And here let a be this empty. Then let a be 1 cons with a. Another operator. Um, column, column. What does it do? It takes one element and then uh, prepends it to a list. It is similar to the cons operator of Lisp, but not identical. You cannot cons two scalar values. You don't get a pair. Because this would be a tuple, and tuples and lists are strictly distinguished in F sharp again. So here we have the cons operator which prepends one to, to the empty list. Then you should have a list with uh, one item of one. But if you uh, look down, down there, this, by the way, is the expression for an empty list. So actually, the list itself is a mutable data type? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, list itself is an immutable data type. And this is um, not a default.net type, though it is implemented for .net, you can use it in other, other languages. It is actually a single linked list and has therefore, as long as you only need a forward um, iteration, um, faster than the C sharp default list, uh, the C sharp linked list. And it also takes, of course, um, less uh, space, especially on 64 bit. Um, 64-bit uh, architectures when you will have 8 bytes per pointer. Now, next part. Um, mutable variables are allowed. This is important uh, because we still exist on .NET, we can still everything do, uh, do everything that .NET can do. Also, it is derived from ML and uh, from OCaml, I mean, and OCaml also has mutability. And, well, the syntax is simple, but you see it's more inconvenient, you have to write mutable. And that's good that way. And for changing, for modifying a value, you need this operator, this um, arrow to the left side. Um, this, of course, only compiles if it is actually a mutable value. And, yeah, then you see we get one, we set two, and when we print this ominous uh, uppercase A, which prints everything, um, you have two. So. Um, you typically won't use mutable values very much for a very simple reason. Well, first, it is a function for programming language which is convenient to write uh, these immutable types. You do have immutable collections. You have an immutable map. You have an immutable list. Uh, list. And just uh, two months ago, Microsoft, the um, framework team, uh, published uh, their immutable collections library which includes stacks, queues, um, ordered map, unordered map, ordered set, unordered set, and a few other 
times two, and those, well, those are uh, well optimized immutable collections. But of course, immutable collections have um, some disadvantages. They, at, depending on what you do, they perform worse. Um, that's of course not true all the time. And for instance, is it not true if you have uh, if you use multi-threading? and you need a snapshot semantics. For instance, you have a list, uh, you have a collection of observers for some uh, type that, um, well, uh, triggers uh, whenever it updates. Then um, an immutable uh, collection, you can just take this value and iterate over it and trigger all the observers that are registered. If you have a mutable collection, then you first need, well, either to lock it or to copy it, uh, or have some other kind of um, stable iteration mechanisms under modification, and all of those usually are, well, perform quite bad. So it um, depends, of course, on what you want to do. Um, for most things, um, the performance is not a problem. Only you should know, for instance, a list insert mutable collection is, um, log is uh, O of 1, it's in constant time. With a mutable collection it's usually uh, logarithmic uh, with the length of the list. Because it's internally built as a tree, so that it provides um, efficient updates, if, uh, efficient insertion, but it's still not in constant time. So, functional first continue, tail call em elimination. Um, what you see here is not tail recursion. Um, what is tail recursion? Or oh, no, what is tail call elimination? Okay, I, I start with what is not tail call. <laughs> what is not a tail call? Um, let's have recursive calls. Uh, let's rec foo n and match n with 0 is 0 and every other value. This is um, this underscore is this wildcard operator which you basically can use quite about everywhere. You can use it in a let binding, you can use it um, well in destructuring binds, you can use it in type arguments if um, a sharp, uh, if for instance you need to tell the compiler that it is a list and not a set but the type argument for this generic collection, is it a list of integers or is it a list of load? Yeah, the compiler can still deduce uh, itself. So then instead of writing int double or a complicated um, class name, you just write this underscore. Yeah. And in this case, in this match, uh, in this matching, um, it just means okay for every other value. It's like the else uh, part. And what does it do? If zero, if n is zero, then return zero. Else return what you return with n plus one. So with one less plus two. And if this, if you now take a very large m, like let's say half of the integer range of the 32-bit integer range, then you will get into problems with your stack. Because whenever you call a function, um, you, the old function is on the stack and you have to, um, well, you put the arguments on the stack. You also put usually your return address on the stack, and if you call a function which calls itself, which calls itself, the stack grows downwards ever more, and then suddenly you don't have any RAM anymore, and then game over. So, and this is. Um, are you sure about function calls here? Because uh, most of the time, uh, functional languages don't even make a function call, but just a go to. So, this one can be tail recursive and in functional languages. Yeah, there of course is some magic in compilers uh, which try to understand such simple patterns. But the thing is, um, you do not want to rely too much on the compiler. The F# -sharp compiler is okay, but uh, I don't think that it will. In as soon as there is three. Um, mutual recursion and you also make it not tail recursive, you will probably lose. It will probably not automatically deduce the existence of an um, accumulator. So the same as with GCC in C. Don't depend on the function being tail recursive. Um, 
Depends. If you write it, tail recursive. No, 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 in, in this case. Oh, in this yes, case. in that case, um, yeah, recursion, if you don't write it, tail recursive yourself, you don't have the guarantee. Another thing, um, the default um, in the debug build is to deactivate the tail recursion. Okay. Which I can understand, and it's quite convenient, but this of course changes quite a few, uh, quite a few things. Usable stack traces. Usable stack traces, but well, um, running out of stack. Okay, for this example, does it work for very large ends? <laughs> Did you try it out? <laughs> I didn't try it out. <laughs> 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 no, um, okay. But I know that this works. Um, so, uh, what is different here? Well, first, the function is named bar and not foo. Second, it gets an accumulator value, and then it gets an n. And now we again match n, and zero is the accumulator value, and everything else returns, well, the result of the previous bar call, uh, of the bar call with n minus one, plus accumulator value plus two. So if we uh, look back here, we call the previous iteration, and then we add two after it has returned. Here we um, calculate the accumulator, then we calculate the next iteration value, and then we call bar. This means after bar returns, uh, nothing has to be done with the return value anymore. And because nothing has to be done to the return value anymore, this is a so-called um, fail call. And this is optimized by a sharp, by guarantee. And is also one of the advantages of the um, CLR virtual machine versus um, the Sun or any other Java virtual machine. It has a dedicated instruction for, for tail call. So um, it doesn't even replace it with go to. Um, it tells the virtual machine that it wants a tail call and the virtual machine um, then optimizes it depending on what it wants to do. Um, this is quite nice. Um, especially because you could deactivate such op optimization in the virtual machine if you are doing too much crazy stuff, which I probably don't. Um, but yeah. Um, any, just for those who have not yet um, functional programming experience, is this tail call anything where you want um, to have some additional explanation? Or on the currying or function composition? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, if you keep the questions to this level, then we might even finish in the one hour that I promised. <laughs> yeah, we are halfway through. <laughs> Probably a syntactic question. Is it even possible to, for example, put the vertical bar in the previous line or something like this? Or does F sharp enforce it to start every case in a new line, for example? Um, yes, you can write it in one line. Okay. Without a problem. Okay. The, first, the first part here is even optional, and then you can write it in one line. Okay. Um, also, all the examples that you see is the so-called light syntax of F-sharp, mm -hmm. which is heavily inspired by Python, uh, because indentation is um, significant. Um, but it's still completely compatible to the old um, not light um, <laughs> syntax, which is uh, much more similar to what you know from traditional ML style languages, where you have an if and an and at the end, or you have a do block and an and at the end, or you have a um, um, semicolon, semicolon at some end, and you can still write in that. And sometimes you even use it if you really have, so if you, if you really just want those 20 characters in one line. But, um, well, in this case, you wouldn't even need that. You could just um, continue on the same line. Um, yeah, but I said at the beginning, it's not... Um, ah, yeah, just because I see here the, the link um, example from Batibix. Um, almost all of those examples were not from me, because I was searching for examples which are easy to understand, and I am not good at understanding art. Uh, understanding <laughs> at explaining uh, things in an easy way. So. Um, if somebody gets the slides um, where I got those examples from um, is always linked here, yeah, although I, I sometimes or usually uh, change them a little bit. Okay, but multivariate pragmatic, imperative style. You can use imperative, of course, also. Uh, but 
Does this mean you have for loops? You have while loops? You have 